Hello, hi, my name is uh, Daniel Kirsch and welcome back to American government. And this is uh, the lecture on Congress. So here we go. So I wanna begin by saying that all I'm gonna to do today is go over some of the main points uh, of knowledge. I won't promise I'm gonna give you a comprehensive lecture on every single thing that Congress does. Uh, what I will do is give you an overview of the way Congress is supposed to work. Uh, and the role it plays once some of the more distinctive characteristics uh, of Congress, uh, what they do, and what political science has been able to tease out uh, about the way Congress functions. Maybe the motivations of some of the key players, uh, and you know, why do we talk about Congress? Well, what kind of power do they have? Uh, well, Congress is imbued with the legislative or lawmaking power in the Constitution. President can execute the laws of the Supreme Court, uh, and the Supreme Court can interpret those laws, uh, and we're going to go over those in other lectures. Congress, in terms of the laws they make, the laws they write, are having to do mostly with the federal government spending money, uh, regulation about how the money is spent. And so every year when you see Congress hard at work on some controversial issue, it's almost always about the budget. Uh, the money they've decided to tax, uh, collecting taxes, or the money they've decided to spend, uh, and the gap between the two in terms of the money they have to borrow uh, from, from other parties, like other banks and other national banks and other, other uh, private banks. All this has to be approved and legislated by Congress annually and signed by the President. Whether it's an education bill or an infrastructure bill or a health care bill or a tax bill, it's all about their taxing and spending power how much they're exercising it or alter, altering the terms of how they use that power. So that's the way that the laws in the U.S. work. Uh, when the Constitution was being written, there's a decision by all the people who were writing it. They wanted to have some version of the British parliamentary system. Uh, they were afraid that the executive branch would be a little bit too powerful. They also thought that Congress had the same potential. Uh, if a person or branch became too powerful, it wouldn't matter how representative Congress was. So they built all these checks into the Constitution uh, to be able to balance those powers. So no one branch was supposed to be dominant. Uh, it has emerged uh, that uh, in the last few decades, the president seems to be in some ways much more powerful than Congress uh, or the Supreme Court. However, there are certain checks on the presidency. Congress does have... Um, at its legal disposal, it has to approve all the president's judicial nominees, uh, as well as all of the, um, the executive branch nominees, a lot of the executive branch nominees, and the rest of the um, judiciary. So the Senate is, in, is the part of the Congress that has to do that. So not the House, which is made up of 435 members. The House has 435 members, the Senate has 100. Uh, and so some states uh, get representatives taken away uh, every census, and uh, the population is not expanding as quickly as the rest of the uh, U.S. So in California, so for the first time ever, California will lose a representative. Uh, and the House is going down from 53 to 52. Uh, it's still the largest state uh, by a pretty far margin. I believe number two is either Texas or Florida. Uh, it can decrease the power. Um, it can decrease the power in one's district or one's hometown uh, that it wields within Congress when you have fewer representatives battling for those funds uh, and more attention from the federal government. And, and given the unpopularity of Congress, uh, for most people, you would think that no one would shed a tear for losing one or two members of that body from their state. However, there's this weird dichotomy where people love their member of Congress, but hate Congress. Um, and so if you've heard that terrible joke, uh, you know, if pro is the opposite of con, what's the opposite of progress? Congress. Uh, it's just making fun of the fact that they can never seem to agree on anything. Uh, but it's really it's likely that Congress is just a proxy, you know, the, for the fact that Americans can never seem to agree on anything. Uh, so it's really not Congress's fault in that regard. Uh, they're doing their best to advocate uh, for all of us so they can get reelected. So that's a very charitable thing I just said about Congress. Uh, those, those battles you see, the battles, their cons you know, for their constituents at home that want 
they want them to fight to win. Uh, if they haven't reached across the aisle, it means they haven't betrayed, right, what the people who sent them there uh, told them to do, to fight for their beliefs, for their principles, for their interests. Uh, so maybe you know there's one, um, there's one argument. Uh, so that's one argument for, you know, for Congress. Anyway, it's a typical story. It's, uh, it's borne out by public opinion research surveys. When people are asked, um, do you approve of the job your member of Congress is doing? And they say, oh, yes, absolutely. They're, they're great. Uh, they gave me, sent me a nice glossy mailer, uh, you know, that I got in the mail the other day. Uh, in fact, they said they were behind all of our first responders. They got us disaster relief. They made sure that there were, they, they knew, that we knew there was upcoming changes for Social Security benefits and veterans benefits we all needed to know about, uh, about health care and education and defense. So this is what a lot of people know about their member of Congress, but notice it's not easy once I tell you all those things that sound very positive. You can't necessarily tell, you know, uh, what, mem what that member of Congress's political party is, which is a pretty basic fact. Uh, it's the basis on which people vote a lot of the time. So let's see. So that's the point. Uh, you don't know if this person is a Republican or Democrat. Chances are um, the mail the person got, which is free, uh, it's free for mail uh, to, uh, to mail from members of Congress to their constituents with their photo, their name splashed everywhere, the nice logo, the nice U.S. House of Representatives seal on it. Uh, that person probably was a frequent voter, uh, that, that person who received the mail, uh, who may or may not have belonged to the same political party the member belongs to. So if you love one member of Congress, uh, your member of Congress, chances are you live in a district that is overwhelmingly home to one party or the other, which is most of them. Uh, it certainly helps the image of a member of Congress and not entirely to, um, uh, to appear to be in one camp or another. Uh, it helps feed the narrative that they're running against uh, business as usual in Washington. Uh, and business as, you know, running against business as usual is a campaign tactic that is very much business as usual. Uh, so, let me see. So they want to get as many votes uh, as they can from non-party members as well to secure their re-election. So people love their member of Congress, but why do they hate Congress? Well, as I said, it's often seen for, as a proxy for Washington, D.C., uh, or the federal government itself, or the economy, or really anything that's not going right uh, in the U.S. Uh, it gets blamed squarely on Congress. It's, it's easy. It's not one person. It's a house. You know, it's 435 members, or it's 100 senators. Uh, so there are, those are people who spend their entire career, oftentimes in Washington, D.C., or at least working in D.C. half the time. The other half the time or more, uh, they're back in their state or district, uh, uh, or they're, you know, they're going to barbecues or coffee hours or virtual town halls. They're being seen. They're opening new businesses. They're walking in parades. Uh, they're communicating with business and labor party leaders to be able to get their name out uh, in a positive way to voters. So they have to have it known that they're a trusted friend in Washington. Uh, and with the advent, again, of airplanes in the second half of the 20th century, it's become possible now, and it is the norm for most members of Congress to spend most of the year in the district or fundraising outside of Washington. Um, they don't spend all their time in Washington as they used to. Uh, it used to be the case that you have people living together in kind of dorms, um, people, I mean members of Congress, living together in kind of dorms, just kind of flats, you know, flop houses or boarding houses, and, and you know, before their, their pensions got really high, um, for weeks and months at a time when Congress was in session uh, for about three or four months. And they would take the train back home when Congress uh, finished this business. Now Congress is in and out of session all year, uh, so they can fly home whenever they want. So it's very different uh, for people, and they don't reach across the aisle for reasons like that. Uh, they don't want to also alienate their voters or constituents at home, so they tend not to step outside of their, you know, um, partisan comfort zone uh, as much as they may used to have. So I'll talk more about the word constituents in a little bit. Uh, they simply don't uh, know the people in Washington as well. Uh, you may have seen this whole idea of a trustee or delegate in your textbook. Let me just try to break it down for you a little bit. Uh, so let's talk about the word trustee. Uh, it comes again from the British parliamentary system, as a lot of things do. 
uh, you can kind of act uh, as if you're electing someone to act as a decision maker on your behalf uh, for the people, um, the members of this re representative body, to everyone you're supposed to represent, not only your voters, but also who is in government. You're supposed to represent the whole government and the whole nation in a way. Uh, you're supposed to represent all of society as a member of the legislature, past and present. You know, you're, you're kind of a venerated member of this decision-making body of Congress. Um, so, as if you had the interests of everyone together at the same time, all the time, and they have to take responsibility for governing society, no matter what the wishes of the people who elect them are, uh, and the people who theoretically elected them to represent not only their views and interests, but the interests... Uh, of everyone, they should be inseparable from all of society. So that's a trustee. A delegate, uh, that's something different. A delegate is just supposed to be a voice uh, or an actor uh, for people in government, on be in the government, on behalf of the people who have elected them. Uh, so for people in their district uh, or their home who have elected them in accordance with their express wishes and opinions, very often it comes down in terms of whether you're going to act more like a trustee or a delegate. Uh, it, it all comes down to how is this going to help me get reelected. So that's a strong incentive uh, to kind of follow the delegate model instead of the trustee model and kind of use your own judgment. Uh, so you might actually think the delegate model is winning, and that may be true. One theory supporting this view is a theory called the electoral connection, uh, which is you can boil everything down. Um, it's a theory in political science that says you can boil everything down. A member of Congress does into one simple question. Will this, will doing this thing, whether it's voting or, or you know, getting up in the morning uh, or, or voting on a bill or, or sending out a mailer or, or doing certain fundraising, uh, or anything, making, you know, certain alliances uh, or public appearances of any kind, uh, or taking positions on issues. Um, is this going to help me get reelected next time? Uh, they have an agenda. Any given day uh, of which they're, you know, any, any given bills they're talking about uh, are to get them reelected. Uh, and uh, so that's seeing what's popular among their voters that will, that will do so. So what's going to get them noticed in their district so they can get reelected? They go to a fundraising dinner to get reelected on a certain night so they can get more money to spend on advertising so they can get reelected. The sponsor, they sponsor certain kinds of legislation that are popular uh, in terms of the priorities in their district. They belong to a particular political party that's popular in their district. Um, but this theory is not without its critics, of course, because maybe it's just so simple uh, that some people think it's simplistic. Uh, but here's the most convincing part of the argument. Uh, if you were to design an institution where the main purpose was to get all the members who were already elected re-elected, you really couldn't do a better job uh, than the United States Congress. Uh, even any year when the majority party is voted out, you still have over 90% of members running for re-election re re-elected. So most years is north of 95%. Let's see. So there's a lot of lopsidedness in those legislative districts. Uh, it's drawn by people who are basically benefiting the most from them. So it's very rare uh, to have a competitive, a really genuinely competitive election. Uh, but there is, out of 435, there's always a few uh, every, every couple of years. So most of the time when you see a closely contested election for any congressional seats, um, it's, uh, there's three elements uh, that every Congress person has to know and excel at. Uh, one is advertising, one, getting one's name known in the district to people who vote. It can be simple as putting an ad on TV, uh, but it's also just showing up in one's community. As I mentioned, uh, they're out sending out mailers that are paid for by the taxpayers or political parties or campaign funds they raise anytime. Uh, and anytime you see a lot of people anywhere in your district, which is less common uh, during, during the pandemic, um, but anytime you expect to see a lot of people for any reason, uh, that's, uh, you should expect to see a member of Congress there, or at the very least, a, a local legislator uh, or public official. Chances are uh, there's, there's, um, they just want to be associated with the positivity in the community. Uh, they also do something called credit claiming, uh, 
which means that in their advertising, they, uh, they say, oh, I voted for a bill or uh, I got us $10 million for roads so, so they could just get renovated over on Main Street, um, or I got the funds for a new park, et cetera, et cetera. That was me. I helped co-sponsor a bill. Uh, I also, I was able to get those funds included in the latest spending bill. I do all these things for the district. If you want to do things like this, uh, if you want these things to keep happening, you need to reelect me. So they do, let's see. Then they do something the least often, which is position taking. Uh, it's generally the least favorite thing that members of Congress do. They take positions on controversial issues for one of two reasons. One is the position they will take will make them popular. It's a popular position among people in their district, or they're forced because they have no other choice. They've been boxed in either by events or by someone from the media that has cornered them in some way, either in a debate, or there's simply too much outside political pressure for them to not have a position. So the problem with being a member of Congress is you have to agree with all the people all the time and lead them at the same time. So when you write to a member of Congress, you should know that they have a response for you about an issue that makes it seem like they're on either side of the issue that you're on. So for instance, uh, if, you wanted to, if you wanted to write to them saying more money should be given to education from the federal government, they would send a response for you saying, thank you for writing, we agree, education is a priority, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's why I, I, I may have voted for this. Uh, they don't talk about, you know, maybe they opposed a bill that had more money going to education. Then they, and they otherwise uh, wouldn't provide that information because uh, they want to have this kind of solidarity with you. Uh, and so then they say other, a list of other accomplishments related to education, and they thank you for your consideration and for writing to them again. And then they stress the need for so then they stress the need for saving. Uh, as, so then you say um, they get another, they get another uh, letter saying that we think education money should be cut. And so they send uh, a letter saying stressing the need for saving uh, and many aspects of what the education depart, uh, department does, they may agree with or disagree with. Um, so they, they're very artful, they're very crafty. They get, you know, they get people, um, which sounds really negative, I know, I'm sorry, but I have to say that simply because I, I saw it from that side. I, I was an intern for a member of Congress once and I was able to see, you know, just how much um, spinning there is uh, in communications with constituents. And so they, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of strange how, you know, no matter what you write, they're on your side, they agree with you. Uh, and so if you write to them, and you're not a supporter of theirs, they're gonna basically, they're not trying to persuade you about the issue when they write back, they're trying to persuade you about, okay, so you should support me if this is the way you feel. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me get back to this uh, discussion of what constituents really are. Constituent is really anyone who lives in the district, particularly people who can support that member of Congress in some way for re-election uh, to office. So in the case of the House, anyone who lives there or contributes to one's campaign is a constituent. Poss possibly someone who's an employer of a lot of people in that district they would call a constituent. Uh, or just someone who's an outside, who lives elsewhere and who's an outside fundraiser, they're a constituent. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they don't happen to live there. So as long as they are contributing to that person's effort to be elected or re-elected, that person is a constituent. Now let's talk about the structure of Congress itself, or could, by the way. So just because they voted against you, they're still a constituent. So let's talk about the structure of Congress itself. Uh, one of them is parties. Uh, and, you know, and the parties are the Republicans on one side, the Democrats on the other. And of course, almost every public office in the U.S. is contested between at least a Republican and a Democrat. Uh, and in Congress specifically, in the House and the Senate, there's party leadership structure that operates as kind of a shadow leadership structure. Um, in the, if one party happens to not be in the majority, uh, the party in the majority, uh, the leader of the Democrats, for instance, in the House right now is Nancy Pelosi of San Francisco. Uh, her position is called speaker uh, when you're the leader of the majority party. 
Uh, there is a position called majority leader, but you know that's that's the number two ranking person. Uh, so she's number one, and she's the leader. And kind of uh, let's see the then there's the assistant majority leader. Blah blah. blah. Uh, so that's in the house. Primarily though. Uh, it's her job to speak on behalf of the House, but also on behalf of the Democrats who hold the majority in the House. Uh, she gets to decide what bills are argued or debated, what bills are scheduled for a vote. So procedurally and institutionally, she has some power. Uh, there's also the party leadership controls funds from the Democratic Campaign Committee. So they can decide whether to back you for re-election or send someone else as the party's endorsed candidate. Uh, it's kind of always this implicit threat that the leader has. Uh, so they have a whole, you know, Democratic caucus. That's the name of the group of uh, House Democrats. On the Republican side, the leader is called usually the Republican leader or the majority, I'm sorry, the minority leader. Right now, uh, it also is someone from California, uh, Kevin McCarthy, uh, who is called the Republican leader uh, in the House. He doesn't have the same power to schedule legislation that the speaker does, but he does have control over influence, control or influence over party campaign funds. So he has that. Uh, he also can advise typically the, um, the majority party uh, on, on uh, who to appoint to what committee. Uh, so he does this, uh, let's see. So, so he negotiates a lot of that with, with uh, Nancy Pelosi typically. So, in the Senate, there is there is someone called the Senate Majority Leader who really runs the Senate. And right now, that's Chuck Schumer of New York. Uh, he's uh, a Democrat from New York, uh, as I said. And um, they negotiate with the Speaker uh, and with the President the main tenets of the annual federal budget. Uh, so, so right now, we're looking at $6 trillion. Uh, we can also note that... Um, in terms of the features of who is in the House, uh, still women are still less than 25% of the members of the House. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's much higher in many other comparable nations, but, you know, the U.S. has about 25% women in Congress overall. Let's see. All right, so one last thing with committees. Uh, there are a couple of different kinds. It comes to two types of committees. One type is the authorizing committee. So, talking about committees. Uh, some examples are the agriculture committee, the transportation committee, the health and human services committee, military affairs. Uh, they write a budget. They get requests from various departments uh, and that they, they uh, in the federal government. They receive uh, budget requests. But there's also a, and, and like the Agriculture Committee oversees the Agriculture Department, for example. So they write the budget uh, for, or the authorized budget, uh, that, that is a reflection uh, of both congressional priorities and executive branch priorities. But there's also a subcommittee on appropriations that oversees agriculture. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. One, so the Appropriations Committee is the other type of committee. So every other committee in the House is an authorizing committee, and, and uh, it's their job to recommend not only all the programs that need money spent, but also how much they recommend uh, and how much money needs to be spent. And, and uh, let's see, they try to fulfill them or cut them in some way, but the Appropriations Committee is the very senior committee uh, that you have to be a senior member of Congress just to be considered uh, for membership on. And um, I say the word senior, it means they rank higher, it means they have more power and influence. Generally, they've been in Congress longer. Uh, so in the Appropriations Committee, they kind of have the final say over how much money is spent in every program and agency and department in the federal government in the final spending bills. So I think it's fair to say that even though things have changed in terms of the structure of Congress and committees, uh, that the Appropriations Committees still have the most power uh, of any committee in Congress. A uh, committee gets hold of a bill after the speaker has sent it to their committee for consideration. There's all kinds of places where a bill can die. Uh, that's, when, that's why thousands and thousands of bills are submitted to the House and the Senate every year by members, uh, but very few of them actually get to the floor. Mostly it dies in committee. Uh, usually the speaker will send it uh, to the right committee uh, to, to uh, discuss it and maybe vote on it. 
uh, among members of the committee and then send it back to the speaker for consideration. Uh, but that will really only happen if the chair uh, agrees it either needs to be passed or it needs to be debated in public for some reason, even if it's going to fail. So they, if they do schedule it for a discussion, they might not schedule it for a markup where they actually go in and make amendments and changes uh, so that it can be ready to be voted on on the House floor. Uh, let's see, so Congress is this kind of giant constant negotiation uh, over resources, both within Congress and in terms of the structure, but also in terms of the bills and their funding. They authorize um, government spending, so it's all about power and money. DC, Washington, that's what it's all about. Um, so you can see how it can grow very distasteful very quickly. Uh, if you don't have the stomach for politics, not, it's not all appearing on TV and being popular and making speeches. It's also this very, you know, difficult, uh, constant political negotiation that's happening. So you, always get a, so you can always get a little bit more power, a little bit more money in one's budget, a little more ability to secure one's re-election the next go-round. And by the way, uh, we'll get to this later on uh, in, in special interests and lobbying, but uh, generally a great retirement plan for members of Congress after they're done with Congress is to triple their salary or more uh, and go be a lobbyist trying to sell uh, influence from private interests to members of Congress. So we'll talk about that more later. Uh, so that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at what Congress does, is they have oversight of the executive branch uh, one thing your textbook discusses is there's two real models of congressional oversight of committees. And we'll take the example of, say, the Military Affairs Committee over the Department of Defense. And they might have, in this instance, something called a police patrol mentality. Uh, or you have a fire alarm oversight structure. Uh, so the Military Affairs Committee in the House, they might have a police patrol hearing where they call the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense to a hearing about the role of American troops having moved from uh, Europe to Asia uh, and, and uh, the Western European kind of NATO model to the Pacific Ocean and China. And so, you know, all the other interests in Asia that the U.S. has. So, for example, they call this low-ranking person in the Defense Department. They say, you know, come up here before us. Can you tell us more about this? Maybe it's an informative kind of hearing. Uh, all members in the committee may or may not show up. Uh, but then there's the fire alarm ment mentality, when the structure that's usually this, this occurs when there's some public scandal, where there's been mismanagement. Um, so several years ago, I think about 10 years ago or more, there was a lot of mismanagement uh, brought to light in the Veterans Affairs Department, Walter Reed Hospital in, in D.C. to be specific. It was not you know, up to a lot of uh, standard of care uh, standards. So many people thought it needed to be... Uh, you know, better for returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. So the fire alarm type of oversight hearing is when you get the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, as in this case, in front of the committee, uh, in front of the whole committee, and they're at their mercy. And they try to tell you, you know, you screwed up. I think you should be fired, that kind of thing. So why did this happen this way? Why do they do that for the cameras? So the people in their district can know that they're fighting for them, for their tax dollars, for their honor, you know. Uh, they happen to have the opportunity, it's a golden one, to get that national exposure, maybe for higher office, maybe for the people in your district. Uh, and that, so to know that, that one is a big shot, a celebrity. Um, so that's really day to day what the offices of Congress, uh, members of Congress do. So if one works for a member of Congress, there's a good chance there may be someone who, you know, receive calls, letters, or emails, or other internet messages from people who live in your district who are having trouble getting Social Security checks or Medicare coverage or Medicaid coverage. They're calling you as a last resort to advocate on one's behalf to the agency and the federal government, which is usually denying them some kind of benefit. So this could be the Department of Veterans Affairs. Very often, uh, for healthcare, this phenomenon in the U.S., part of what endears people to their member of Congress, irrespective of party, um, is called casework. It's very much a nonpartisan way of doing things. Uh, they're not one's lawyer. They can make a phone call uh, for a constituent and do some investigating. They can try to find something out. They can maybe advocate, but they're not kind of legally obligated to keep fighting for you. Um, and then there's this more traditional, uh, just constant campaigning, door-to-door, -door, public events, TV, ads, mailers, you name it. 
Uh, it's acknowledging people's names and communities. It's not about, uh, certainly not about position taking if it doesn't have to be. It's not supposed to be. It's, it's not about credit claiming. It's about positive reinforcement of their public image. So the more they advertise, the better chances they have of getting reelected. It's more about the personal celebrity, the image a member of Congress has in their district. And finally, it's um, let's spend a moment on the priorities of Congress in U.S. history. Specifically, we need to discuss uh, the fact that they negotiated settlements about slavery between the North and the South and also about tariffs. So really, it was all about harmonizing uh, the growing industrial nature of the U.S. in the North and the West with the agricultural economy, slave-based economy in the South. So it was reconciling these interests that ultimately led to the Civil War and demonstrated that um, reconciliation wasn't so effective. Even Congress, um, when they instituted something called the gag rule, forbid that even the mention of the word slavery in the House or the Senate floor. It's fair to say this was a very shameful time in history, not only for the U.S. Congress, but the U.S. itself. Many senators also held the Senate hostage through a device called the filibuster, uh, keeping racial segregation legal in the U.S. before the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act were finally passed and took effect, and we'll talk about that more later. Uh, one thing you can take away from this is knowing that the Civil War really did fundamentally restructure the government. Uh, it even experimented with an income tax that later uh, well, it was adopted, but not until about 60 years later through the 16th Amendment. So it shifted the revenue gathering from tariffs, from taxes on imports, uh, imported goods to the US, uh, being able to let us have an income tax on citizens. So it made it much more predictable uh, how the revenue was gonna be collected, how much money was gonna be budgeted the next year. So it allowed the federal treasury to spend a little bit more freely and build better credit. But the Constitution is what delegates all of the federal government's powers. It lists and enumerates all of the powers of government from coining money to collecting taxes to establishing post roads, which is kind of the forebearer of the interstate highway system, all the stuff in the Commerce Clause, uh, all that stuff is, you know, we'll talk about it again here. But Congress derives any power they have legally, I would say politically too, from a clause in the Constitution called Article 1, Section 8, uh, which lists all of the different powers about why they even have the ability legally or constitutionally to write laws. Uh, is what allows Congress to intervene in the economy, to negotiate with the president, and ultimately to declare war. So we'll talk more about uh, what the presidency does in the presidency chapter in this same module. Uh, until then, have a good day.